if African politicians don't style up, particularly with the young people who are very impatient, I fear that Africa may find herself going through that phase. And there is already evidence that we have yeah. seen. We saw the Arab Spring, what happened. We saw what happened in Sudan. And, and, and uh, the docile, if they are woken up, will be so devastating that they will render everything topsy-turvy in a manner that will take years to rescue. Yeah. And I hope so, that the politicians will uh, listen to these early voices and begin to do the right thing. Everybody here. Yeah. We are again. Welcome to Worldview, the number one media company. This is where we explore everybody's perspectives on things that can broaden our own perspective. Today we have no other than Professor Patrick Loch Otieno Lumumba, a very staunch our Pan Africanist. He's been around, he speaks on leadership issues across the continent. If you don't know him, I'm worried about you. <laughs> <laughs> and he's been, he's, he's the director of the Kenya School of Law. He's been with the uh, anti-corruption uh, unit in, in Kenya. And uh, what else can I say to introduce you, Prof? Everybody knows it. So welcome to Worldview, Prof. I'm so happy to have you here. And thank you very much for the invitation, Sorry. So when you I start a conversation with you, you, you have done so many interviews in recent days and maybe millions of them over the past number of years. I don't want to have a conversation that we had so many times before. And I think we need to get to a point where we elevate uh, the conversation to not just push into what's wrong and what needs to happen, but saying, mm -hmm. how do we then recommend what can be done? What do you think about that? Let's have a conversation about, let's pretend Soli Mwing is a new, newly elected president of an African country. And what do you say? And he's sitting there in front of you. And what would you say to him? You know, when, when people are elected into public office, uh, they are elected as midwives midwives to ensure uh, that processes are managed for the general good. And as a leader, the most important thing to do is to ensure that you utilize the resources, both natural and human, for the general good. And, and my view is that societies and people require very basic things. People want food on the table. And they therefore want opportunities created. And how are those opportunities created? If you are in an agricultural country, you want to add value to agriculture. You want to mechanize agriculture. You want to go into agro-processing. You want to create an environment that facilitates trade. And say, for example, you are in the Sadak region or in the ECOWAS region or the East African region, how do you leverage on existing uh, instruments that facilitate cross-border trade? How do you deal with tariff and non-tariff barrier issues so that people have the opportunity to thrive? For the younger population, how do you liberate yourself from the whole idea of employment? Of course, employment will always be there, but how do you create environments for innovation and invention? And I believe that any leader who focuses on this and uses the taxes properly will be moving his or her country and society in the right direction. And, and this has been done before. You and me know what uh, uh, the Singaporeans did. We keep on talking about Singapore. We keep on talking about South Korea. We could very well be talking about Rwanda after the genocide, that they have marshaled resources in a very effective way and there is a sense in which the society is moving forward. We can also talk about Botswana, which you and me know in 1960s didn't have very much to write home about, but they have leveraged on their natural resources to move the country in some useful direction. You can also talk about Namibia with her diamond, which until very recently was being cut in Antwerp. They are now cutting it in Binhok. And, and these are the things that I would tell a leader please harness your natural and human resources to ensure that you get maximum benefit for the benefit of the population. But 
if you look at the number of countries in Africa, including my own South Africa, and the lawlessness that is, everybody seems to be doing their own thing, nobody, there are no, there's no accountability. Do you think Africa needs benevolent dictators? I mean, Rwanda for me, I'm, what, what is me? It really does. It seems to me to be a, a country of two narratives. So the narratives yeah. that you've just described, and then there's a narrative of human rights. I, I know Rwandan people who ran away from home because the minute you criticize Kagame, you're out. You're either jailed, killed, exiled, disappeared. Do we need leaders who say, fine, I'm going to do a good job, provided you shut up and don't disagree with me? It's, 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 not an easy, <laughs> it's not an easy question that you pose. This idea of benevolent dictators, I personally don't buy it because in the long run, it is not sustainable. I hold the view that in order for a country to move forward, you need a disciplined environment, law enforcement, that I think is very important. I think that respect for human rights is very important. I hold the view that democracy understood to mean a system where people participate is what is the guarantor of sustainable development. Right. And this presupposes that people themselves are vigilant, presupposes that institutions function, presupposes that leaders are accountable and answerable to the people. So I'm not one to say that you need a benevolent dictator in Africa. I'm one to say that you need a system where institutions respond to people demands and leaders also respond to people's demands. Easier said than done. Right. Particularly I mean, it's easy. If, I mean, somebody... ethnicity is weaponized because sometimes right. ethnicity can be weaponized in a manner that gives legitimacy to actions that are actually dictatorial and which may appear to bring dividends in the short run, but in the long run, it will actually undermine the country. Yeah. You know, when, Rama, when uh, what's his name, uh, Barack Obama visited Ghana many years ago, soon after he became president of, uh, of, of the USA, he said something that I, I can't forget. He said, Africa needs strong institutions, not strong men or strong women. And when you have a president who keeps changing the constitution just for him to stay in power, it's, it's a problem. Don't you think oh, it's yeah, a problem? Oh yeah, without doubt. Sorry, without doubt. And that, that is one of the problems in Africa, that one of the things that leaders, particularly positions in leadership politicians do, is to undermine institutions. Yeah. They undermine institutions so that the institutions are simply instruments that are deployed on a need basis to achieve a short-term political interest. And yeah. how, how do they succeed? This is the question. How is it that African politicians can go scot-free with what you cannot see happening in Europe yeah. or progressively yeah. in Asia? We oh. have seen in the last few weeks uh, the, the, the resignation that have taken place in the United Kingdom, the prime minister resigning. We have yeah. seen the same thing happening in, in Italy. And, and, and this is because institutions function. Correct. And those in positions of leadership are not some kind of demigods. Mm. And, and, and the people also are uh, holding the leaders accountable. Part yeah. of the problem that I think we have in Africa is that the populations are too docile and the populations are too susceptible to being weaponized from an ethnic perspective. So right. that if somebody wields power and they are from your ethnic group, you forgive him all his or her sins and he's allowed to run roughshod over everybody. And, and one must understand that in Africa, we are still grappling with the young post-colonial countries right. where institutions are still very weak, where we have freedom fighters who have a sense of entitlement they that's, think that's that 60 years after them. liberations. Unfortunately, unfortunately, as long as this generation is still alive, they keep on telling you we were jailed. Right. They keep on telling you when we were in the trenches, where we, where were you? When, when you were in the bush, where were you? And these yeah. are the things that, in my view, undermine accountability in Africa. Individuals who suffer from what I call the matter complex. They are always telling you, you owe us, the yeah. country owes us, and it will take people to rise up. The recent event, Soli, in, 
the recent events in Sri Lanka a clear demonstration of what a people who are charged for a particular cause can do. And unfortunately, in many African countries, it will have to take that kind of avenue for leaders to know that they are not themselves people who cannot be dispensed with. But African, uh, do you think African culture in general has anything to do with it? We think to, we seem to place on pedestals people who are leaders. They should be, it should be the other way around. We seem to think they are demigods. We must, when they come into the room, we dance and with them, we are afraid to look them in the eye. We stand up when they come in. They are, so Africans are not generally don't stand up to their leaders. It's the, the leaders think they, because the leaders can use the institution of state to kill people and get away with it. And it's happened over and over again. I'm sorry, it happens in Rwanda too. Oh yeah, without doubt. I can't agree with you more that if you look and, and, and it's good to remember that Africa has diverse cultures, yeah. but when you look across the continent of Africa, we almost treat our cultural leaders as if they are deities yeah. and they can do no wrong. And I think there is a sense in which we have transferred this kind of adulation to elected leaders. We call them honorables, right honorable right, right, excellencies. Right. And when they come, when we are queuing, they don't queue. When we are in the traffic, they don't follow <laughs> rules. So in a short while, they think they can do pretty much anything. But if you look at the history of, of, of countries in Europe, they too went through these phases when they thought that that their kings came from God. Then there was the revolutions and the monarchs became constitutional. You remember in Europe, there was a time when they cut the throats of yeah. all monarchs from in France and they did to, that to, to, to oh, Russia. Yeah. You remember Russia, you remember the revolutions in Europe. Correct. And unfortunately, sorry, if African politicians don't style up, particularly with the young people who are very impatient, I fear that Africa may find herself going through that phase. And there is already evidence that we have yeah. seen. We saw the Arab Spring, what happened. We saw what happened in Sudan. And, and, and uh, the docile, if they are woken up, will be so devastating that they will render everything topsy-turvy in a manner that will take years to rescue. Yeah. And I hope so, that the politicians will uh, listen to these early voices and begin to do the right thing. Well, we've been saying the same thing in South Africa for years. We've been yes. hoping that uh, we wouldn't need a, a an Arab Spring like uprise. But uh, if, if you look at the state of South Africa right now, it's uh, it, it makes one want to cry. One doesn't mm -hmm. want a revolution and coup d'etats and stuff like that. One hopes that the leaders in place will look around the world and look into the mirror and acknowledge that they are not doing everything right. They're doing most things wrong, actually, in South Africa. How do you make those people who, I mean, we have load sharing in South Africa all the time. The people are, the, the economy is really, really in a sad state. For instance, we, our levels of unemployment, youth unemployment up to 65% is really, really high. And the politicians still live large. They drive around with big blue light brigades they don't need. They have security, they have electricity. So how do you expect people like those to have to, load, to grow a semblance of, of empathy? You know, I was in South Africa only yesterday and we had this conversation and, and I can tell you that uh, there are those who will say 28 years since democracy, we are writing our obituary too early, but the truth be told is that there are those who believe and rightly so that the promises made are not being fulfilled and there is no sign that we are moving in the direction of fulfilling them. Right, and that right. the leaders have scales on their eyes and wax in their ears and they are not hearkening to the people's voices. Some of the shooting that you now see in the taverns may be symptomatic of, of, the, of the kind of impatience that young people are beginning to engage in. And, and believe me you, if efforts are not made and made very urgently, we are going to find ourselves shedding, not the loads, but shedding the leaders. It is yeah, how you we should. shed them. It's about time we did. <laughs> yes, 
the, the problem is how will they be shared? Because history has demonstrated that if you shared them by way of good it does, then the joy can only be short lived. And if you allow the movement to come from the bottom without proper leadership, that also can be chaotic. Mm. One therefore hopes that those in positions of leadership, those who are in the freedom fighting movement are going to hearken to the voices of reason. Easier said than done. Because mm. we sound sometimes like broken record as we move around the continent saying the same thing the same thing. And I think sometimes these individuals in positions of leadership, they look at us and say, let them make their noise. Yeah. We'll continue to do what we are okay, doing. With impunity. Yes, there are no consequences. When we live in a place where there are no consequences. There are no consequences. Yeah. Yeah. But it's only what, what tells me that sometimes, sometimes it can take too long that you get worried. And then sometimes it can take a very short time. We have seen even in countries where we thought something could not happen. And you remember yourself what happened in Tiananmen Square yeah. and how it changed China in a fundamental way. You remember the riots in 1908 in South Korea and much more recently, as I've said, what is going on continues to be going on in Sudan where people are in the streets, in the streets of Khartoum almost right. on a daily basis. It is not for the faint hearted. So my own view is these voices that you think are not being heard. It is the cumulative effect of this kind of voices that will ultimately lead to the tsunami that yeah. will lead to change. Right. It may be worse before it becomes better, but we cannot stop moving in the right direction and saying what ought to be said. You yourself, uh, a I'm, testament to how it can be painful if you say the right things. Of course, I know, yeah. and I'm a living yeah. witness. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you, you have a you have a you had a stint with the with the Kenyan Anti Corruption Commission. I mean, mm -hmm. when you look back at that period, and when you look at where it's at today, so assuming that it still exists, is it making a difference in Kenya? Do people listen to those things? And what well, how do you view your role then? I know it was very short. Let, let me tell you my, my own experience with bodies such as those that sometimes we in Africa create bodies because it is the in thing. Right. You know, the, the fight against corruption is one that everybody knows must be undertaken and taken seriously because corruption does undermine democracy, undermine the politics, undermine the economy. That is acknowledged. But I must say that the efforts of these anti-corruption bodies is like watering the desert with a teaspoon. It is so little, the impact is so minimal because the culture of corruption is so deeply embedded and so deeply ingrained. People actually live lifestyle that are financed by corrupt activities. Mm -hmm. And short of a major seismic movement, there is very little that can be done. Of, occasionally you'll have one person arrested here and there, you'll have this property right. seized here and there. But when you look at the cumulative effect of those efforts, out of 10, it only scores no more than five. That is the reality across the continent of Africa. Yeah. So that the dominant all consuming culture is corruption. I'm looking at the ongoing elections here in Kenya, and this must be the most expensive election campaigns here, anywhere in the world, relative to a GDP, helicopters flying that you don't even see that in the United States of America. You don't have not seen anything like that anywhere in the world, relative to a GDP. Politicians whose salaries we know and own five helicopters, not even multi-millionaires do. How do, do they finance that? Does an average Kenyan understand the key issues or are they just like most South Africans, just driven by emotion. Do they really question? Do they make, do they connect the dots? No, they don't. The average voter does not connect the dots. The average voter votes on the basis of who from my ethnic group is present, which ethnic alliance is going to give our men and women the opportunities and the benefit to the average person is what I call the feel good effect. Right. rather than anything right. else right. right so there are no new players in the kenyan political no no uh, new players because the same old the same entire old. system as we know it is currently captured 
so yeah. that the same players that we have had for the last 25 years remain the very same players. I would like us to talk about the concept of the Confederation of African State, which I really like, which in my view is, very, is, is so ideal. It could happen maybe if we had the right people in place. But before we, we go there, there are still too many Africans who flee Africa, who flee African leaders or situations in Africa, who some of whom die trying to cross the Mediterranean into Europe. How do we stop them? And how, why is it that African leaders are quiet on this? The AU is quiet on The AU was quiet when uh, uh, news started spreading around where that African students, uh, or other, others working in Ukraine, trying to flee were blocked, were uh, uh, racially profiled. I have not had a peep from any African leader to say, wait, stop, don't do that to our people. Instead, we complain when, when Europeans have their own, you know, Ukrainians are European, as a matter of fact, when they stand up, we say, but you are, while you're helping your Ukrainians, you're not helping us erase it, which is the most ridiculous yeah. thing anymore. <laughs> Why should they help us? Why yeah. should they? And, and, and solely remember, not just slightly under three weeks ago, you saw those young African men and women being bludgeoned some to death in, in, in Morocco. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. You terrible. saw that. And not even a single voice, apart from a pro forma statement from the African Union, that chapter is now closed. There are people who are dying in the Mediterranean Sea, and many of them are not even reported. We saw recently young Africans being bludgeoned at an airport right, in Tunisia, right. and you don't hear the voices. And the reason why young people are running away from their countries is because the domestic environment does not offer any hope. Yeah. You graduate as an, as an engineer, your country tells you statistically that there is a shortage of engineers, but when you seek employment as an engineer, there are no opportunities because we have exported all our jobs. Look at right. Nigeria, for example, which is the fifth largest yeah. producer of oil in the world. But imports, exports crude oil and imports refined oil, which means that the byproducts such as uh, tar and other things that can be used to make fertilizers is exported to those countries and we export jobs. Look at the entire textile industry. We are importing secondhand clothing from the United States of America. We are importing rice. We are importing in the mineral sector. We are importing minerals in their own form. No beneficiation, no value addition. The net effect is that the, the domestic arena does not offer opportunities for young men and women. And this is why they are running away to engage in menial jobs. In Kenya recently, we have a situation, we have, we have signed an agreement with the government of the United Kingdom to take away nurses to go and get employed. We train our nurses, then they are going to work in the UK while we have a shortage of nurses in our own country. And that can be said of very many Africans. And yet, potentially, we are a market of 1.6 billion, a market of 1.6 billion easily. So right. we have a problem there. And the problem is that I don't see us moving in the direction of trying to resolve. Look at the energy sector now. Mm -hmm. It is either Total Energies or Rubies or Exxon Mobil. We are right. out of it. Look at the mobile telephony industry. We are not there. It is either Vodafone or Orange, mm. is of, of course excluding MTN from South Africa. Look at the banking sector. In all the critical sectors, look at any activities. We terminate all our, our, our payments in dollars. So when right. one talks about in a positive manner that we have now recognized under the African free continental free trade area, that we ought to enhance intra-African trade. This is urgent business. But right. if you are not careful again, it is others who are going to benefit from the Africa continental free trade area. Because remember, the rules of origin says that if a product is only 15%, you could bring in completely knocked down kits mm -hmm. from China, and then right. you add labor and you say that is a Ghanaian product. Mm -hmm. So we've got to style up. It is only when we create those opportunities at home that our young men and women will not want to flee the continent. As it is, they are seeking economic opportunities elsewhere.
but we can cut uh, cut corners. If you look at Europe, for say the EU, the way it functions, they had to agree on some basic uh, regulations across the EU. Uh, we can't come in South Africa, in Africa and say, let's do this, Every, and, but everybody else still does their own thing. For instance, if you look at transporting goods from one country to another, the tariffs are different. Sometimes we have in, informal tariffs in, a, in, a, in the form of bribes. People say, look, I'll let your truck pass, uh, go through if you give me so and so and so. So there's no policing. How, how do we get Africans to co coordinate at a high level, so to create the basics so that the, the, in, uh, the trade can happen, movement of skills and, and people can happen. And obviously, the, maybe hopefully one day we'll get to also uh, to a point where we have the same uh, 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 currency across the continent of Africa, but you can't just impose it. There has to be some basics upon which it sits. How do we get African leaders to understand that? I mean, we talk about these things all the time at conferences and webinars is, all the time. This is the tragedy all the time look at you, you in europe which you are familiar with before you become a member of the european union under the copenhagen rules right. there, there is a waiting period there is a litmus yeah. test yeah. we've got to look at a certain fundamentals Correct. Uh, your rule of law human rights your economic situation before you enter into the european monetary union mm -hmm. in africa we are trying to mimic some of those things and you've seen it in the area, for example, such as movement of person, the Kigali agreement on that. Right. But we still have visa regimes. And yeah. if you move away from the visa regimes, even in the open skies, flying within Africa is the most expensive in the whole world. Yet, very many years ago, we had the Yamasukru agreement on opening the skies. So right. it is not as if we don't know what ought to be done. I think we pretty much know what ought to be done. It is the will to do what ought to be done that does not exist because of suspicion. Mm. We are still suspicious of one another. The former French colonies are much more comfortable dealing with France. The right. former British colonies are much more comfortable dealing with the British under the Commonwealth. The Chinese is a new player. And because our activities are so uncoordinated, it is very easy to undermine them. And they are no real champion for the African Union in positions of leadership. There, there is not a single individual that you can say, this is a champion. We, right. we are so narrow, we are so insular, we, we, this thing of sovereignty, we are so preoccupied with it that we have stopped to think. Yet, within the European Union, you know, they have 27 languages. Right, of course. So you can have a unity of purpose in an environment yeah. of diversity. And this is what we are advocating for, because once you do that, you can move from Slovakia in Bratislava and through to Lisbon in Portugal with a single currency. Yeah. But in Africa, you are dealing with 33 currencies. Mm. Even when you want to transfer money, say from South Africa to Nairobi, the Federal Reserve is going to ask you a myriad of questions. You want to make a phone call from Dhaka in Senegal, you are dealing with, 55 telephone access codes. Why can't we have a single code? The American, America with a population of 300 has only uh, the, this right. one. Even China flying across the continent is a, is a handle. Sometimes you Absolutely. have to go to Europe before you come back to France, Absolutely. to Africa. Yes, so but, these are things, you know, the tragedy, Sony, is that we pretty much know what ought to be done. It's not as if we don't know. Right. But we are not willing to do those things. So what is the push that will make us do these things? The push, in my view, is going to be the people themselves. And I can now begin to see... But they are docile, you said, people, and they are. Business we people are docile. It's not easy. People like Aliko Dangote in Nigeria, people like Tony Elumelu in, 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 uh, in, in Nigeria, who are now opening banks across the continents, mm. are beginning to tell the politicians, and a few politicians are beginning to listen, that if right. I have Dangote cement, which is African, and they are now in 18 African countries, employment needs to be made easy. Taxes or taxation regimes ought to be made uniform. Right. So uh, the leaders are meeting again uh, this week, I think, in Lusaka, Zambia. And I hope that that particular meeting is going to give back to something. East African community leaders are also meeting in Arusha as I speak. I hope that these are some of the things that they are wrapping their minds around.
You mentioned in a recent interview that you, uh, not too long ago, wrote to all the African state, uh, head of, heads of state, only a handful of them, 10, I think, responded yes. to you. Now, if you were given 10 minutes, 15 minutes to, to address them at the AU, what are the two or three main points? What are the, what are the, the three messages you would want to leave with the African leaders? One, let us begin to implement the Lagos plan of action. Number one, let us begin to implement the Lagos plan of action. Number two, let us begin in phases of five years to implement Africa Agenda 2063 to the extent that it deals with the economies, it deals with movements of persons. Let us implement the Kigali agreement on removing travel restrictions within the continent of Africa, and let us implement the Yamasukuru declaration on the open skies. It is a question of implementation. I would not address them for more than five minutes. I would say implementation, implementation, implementation on what we have already resolved. Should we in Africa be worried about climate change? Um, if you look at, for instance, now that there's this uh, conflict happening in Ukraine and the issues of oil and gas shortage, uh, many Western countries now resorting back to fossil fuels, to, to coal, France, Germany, even here in Switzerland, they're beginning to say we might end up rationalizing. Actually, I saw in yesterday's paper the word I, I feared load shading might happen in Switzerland yeah. <laughs> because of what's going on. So so now this now African states, of course, many of them in South Africa, we have lots of coal, but coal is not bad, is not good for the environment. What should we be doing in Africa to play our part? Or should we be concerned about climate change, food oh, yes, security? We, without doubt, right now, you may know that the harvest, this is Africa, first of all, this is the AU declared year of nutrition. Yeah. We have had floods along the Nile in, in, uh, in Sudan. We have had floods in Accra and in Abidjan. And you and me know that there was a time in Cape Town where there was no water. Yeah. Yeah. We have had the, 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 the problem of desertification. So the yields are coming down. The temperatures are yo-yoing from one side to the other. We have every reason to be worried about climate change. And what can we, how does it affect us? It affects the coastal towns are beginning to suffer. And if right. they are suffering, it means it compromises infrastructure. It means that our agriculture is going to be undermined. It means that the, the kind of energy that we are going to use, we've got to think about it. And I think that Africa had better be focusing much more on, on solar energy. How right. can we use wind? How can we use gas? We have large deposits of gas in Tanzania and we have large deposits of gas in Mozambique and of right. course in, in Nigeria. So these are the things that we ought to deal with. Let us not imagine that we are immune from what we are seeing in Europe now in Spain and Portugal. And what has happened and is continuing to happen is telling us that we've got to once again not wait to be given money to implement this thing. Because part of the problem we have in Africa, we're saying, oh, climate change is a problem of, of the global North. Right. It is not a problem of the global South. It is a problem of the world. Maybe we have to find a way in Africa to localize the conversation about climate change so that it's not presented as somebody else's problem. As you say, it's not the global, the West's uh, problem alone. It's our, it's a problem for all of us. Our children in the future, they're going to face, we are already facing the consequences of it. But how do we have this conversation in a way that the average African understands that it is also our problem? I think this thing can be broken down because even if you go into African villages now, in, in a very informal conversation, they'll tell you it never rained during this time. Oh, they blame and, it on the gods, some people, and on the, the ancestors. <laughs> some will argue like that. But, but, but in truth, they'll tell you it's, it was, something is happening. Our yields, the rainy seasons are a little shorter than this. It is a little hotter than this. And if that can be explained to them scientifically, and you don't have to go into complex science, you simply mm -hmm. have to tell them, and it can be broken down, as you rightly say. And, and, and for the future generation, issues such as climate change ought now to find themselves in school curriculum. Yeah. So that we have a young population that grows up knowing 
that the manner in which you conduct yourself is going to affect that if you are going to use wood fill and cutting down trees, it is going to affect the environment and therefore going to affect the climate. People yeah. can actually relate to this. And, and uh, I remember when I was a little younger, tree planting was big business. It's no longer big business. Because what, what, is, what is big business? Tree, tree planting. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, young yeah. Students, now we take them, we take the wood, now, we look yeah, at the now Congo. We just chop the wood. And, and, and I think it is important, even in terms of pollution, people can right. now see, for example, that you could take water from a river and drink it without any processing. But today right. the rivers have become dirty the, through plastic pollution and all these things. And I think these realities are now telling the people it's not because the gods are angry with us. It is simply because we have misbehaved and yeah. continue to misbehave vis-a-vis -vis our relationship with uh, climate and the environment. Don't you think, um, okay, the AU, the African leaders are more or less, uh, you know, um, how to say, um, organized within the AU, even if, even if it's effect ineffective mostly. Don't you think we need a pan-African civil society movement so that we begin to speak in the same languages, not only on climate change issues, but on human rights issues, social justice, so that Africans say, this is what we want. We don't want to be pushed to, taken like, to be taken like children anymore. Because right now, across the continent, African leaders take African people for granted. Without doubt. But remember that even as we talk about the AU, African countries are also regionally organized. You, you, within the East African community, there are things right. that we still yes. do a lot more intimately within right. that. The five regions. Within SADAC, within ECOWAS, within Central Africa, within the Maghreb. So that the AU is, is actually the big umbrella, mm -hmm. uh, but supported as it were by the regional economic blocks. Right. And, and, and I can't agree with you more that indeed this is the truth. And I've seen even in the East African region, you, you look at organized, civil society organizations. Recently, when there was a problem in Serengeti uh, uh, in Tanzania, I saw Kenyan civil society movements saying something about it. And there are quite a number of initiatives within right. the continent and even in their diaspora. The problem is that they are not coordinated so that somebody sitting somewhere in Namibia right. doing something which is Pan-African is completely unaware that there could be a synergy with somebody else sitting in Banjul, the Gambia. And in this day and age of social yeah. media, I belong to a number of initiatives which are now trying to bring together without dissolving any one of them, but say, That's we good. need a melting pot. Because if we speak with one voice, yeah. rather than operating in silos, we are a lot more likely to be heard. Uh, I, I know, for example, there is a petition that we are working on, which has been going doing the rounds for the last two months about the situation in southern Cameroons. And our idea I'd was like, I'd like to, to say that I'm... one million signatures. And once we have these one million right. signatures, we'll send them to President right. Bia in, in, in Cameroon and to the AU for purpose of telling them that the situation in Ambazonia in southern Cameroon needs attention. This is the kind of initiative that we need. And if we do it consistently, then I think our voices will be heard when they are from Dhaka to Addis Ababa, from Cape Town to Cairo, from Bangui to right. Burkina Faso. Do you think that you mentioned somewhere that Africa will or might be recolonized in 25 years? Are we heading that way or are there? things that we can still do to make sure it doesn't happen of course what kind of colonialization the it is not going to be the primordial permit me to say colonization like the, some some white person from the united kingdom or from france coming to be the administrator or a governor no they'll allow you you'll do your elections you'll have your people you'll have black faces in different countries the kind of colonization that one is talking about is economic, is economic colonization. Because if the IMF and the World Bank and the Chinese and all these bodies are going to lend you money and control your monetary policy and control your policy in all critical areas, then that is largely a colonial project. So this is, the, it's, yeah. it's, it's going to be subtle and you can already see it in a number of countries, the level of indebtedness 
of African countries to multilateral organizations is of such a nature that it affects our currencies. We are no longer in control of our currencies. If you look at the retail sector, yeah. for example, right now, in many African countries, you see in supermarkets, in, 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 in transportation, those who control our transport is either Uber or Bolt. Uh, if you look at the manner in which we transfer money, it is SWIFT. If you look at uh, the security world, is Wells Fargo, is Gada world. So in the critical economic areas, in the name of globalization, we see that is non-African companies that are involved and our economies are actually controlled from outside. This is the kind of colonization that I'm talking about. And, and so that the Africans will continue to play very menial and minimal roles in the day-to-day -day running of their countries. And you can see, for example, in a Do you? people like uh, Tony Blair are very busy across the continent advising African presidents. And, 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 and I don't think they are doing it uh, with the best of intentions. Do you sit down uh, together with the West? For instance, what would Africa have been? Because the thing is, that the truth of the matter is that a lot of our systems, the technology we use, the infrastructure, a lot of what we have is 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 has got its roots in Europe and Western Europe. The economy, the global economy, is so we know we're operating in a system that is not African. Um, but we can also separate Africa from the West, Af from the rest of the world. Rather, Africa is not an, an island. How do we make Africa still stand on its on his two legs and be able to look at the others in the eye, you know, we, while operating in this global system. I don't want, I don't think it's possible to suddenly say, let's go back to 500 years ago or to six, six no, no, years no, ago when all. Africa had never not come. But we need, we, so is it, are we on a, on, on a back foot operating in a system that is not African by design? John Henry Clark, the great African-American, said that uh, on the explosion of independence in Africa, all African countries borrowed the systems from Europe, parliamentary systems of Europe, and he says African countries will never succeed by mimicking those systems. But yet I think that if you creatively borrow from systems, you can then up, come up with systems which are unique within the continent of Africa. And I think that that is a possibility. And we have examples in the world that tell us that you can retain certain aspects which are unique to you, borrow from elsewhere and be successful. Look at uh, the South Koreans. Right. They have borrowed what you may describe as, as Western models, but they right. have left them well. their own circumstances. Look at Japan, look, look at uh, China, Look at the Qataris in the in the Middle East here. Look at the Bahrainis. Look at Brunei. Look at the United the Emirates. In, yeah. in other words, you borrow the best from elsewhere, bring it into your own environment, and make it acclimatize, and then you succeed. But this idea that we are going to simply go back to the past and uh, jettison all, of course, that that would be stupid. I think we are all uh, of, of the same race and we can borrow best practices from elsewhere and use them to good effect. For example, even traditional rulers, I think traditional dispute resolution systems are very effective as we have seen traditional land ownership system. So what is not consistent with our level of development can of course be changed and or, or, or done, uh, dealt with in a manner that will accommodate the realities of the moment. This is what we ought to do. Sometimes I think, we are like, like the outsiders who whip more than the bereave. We bring in systems which we don't understand and we don't want right. to uh, uh, customize them to address our unique circumstances. But, and this, I really like what you just said. But, you know, I saw an anecdotal account of, an, of uh, somebody who's employed by an African state as a technician uh, at, at, who, who participates in bilateral discussions, you know, negotiations on stuff. And, and he said, the problem is that we, we, the technicians who know what needs to happen, say what clauses need to go into an agreement, 
get um, undermined by the, the people we're talking to going to our president and we don't know what the president gets given and the president will say no 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 take that clause out but that's the clause that protects you your interest that enhances your interest so they are un with the, the participation the in the the the, the, comment here, the the participation of politicians or the political uh, i um, um how to say imposition on onto technical discussions many times put africa at risk how do we separate the political people from those guys who are who, whose job it is to negotiate the best deals possible for africa for the states you know, when, when you've seen delegations of different countries, particularly Europe and Asia progressively, when they are going to serious negotiations, the technocrats are given their pride of place. And the politicians merely come at the level of siding the dotted lines. The reverse is true in many African countries. You go for a delegation on serious uh, deliberations and what you see are politicians who have no idea what they are signing. Let me give you a very interesting story that happened just recently, not related to signing. Right. We have the World Athletic Champions in Oregon, in the United States. And in Kenya, the athletes were left behind and the officials went. So the people who were going to do the actual running <laughs> were, not, were not the first people to go. <laughs> so it tells you that, that, that there is something the matter. And the same argument is the same behavior is what we see. So it, is, it takes politicians, it takes leadership that is conscious to know that you need expertise and that when you become a leader you don't have the monopoly of wisdom in many african countries i'll give you an example if you are running an airline uh, you will discover one day one day in the morning you have all passengers booked to fly to new york and then your president says i'm going to accra and they say i need that plane they don't care whether you are booked they don't care whether you are running a commercial it is, it's, I don't know what happens. And it's the same kind of behavior. So in a nutshell, I'm saying that the African technocrat is a very unhappy technocrat because nobody listens to him. In other parts of the world, you'll see professors at university are advising on matters of climate change, on matters of economics, on all diverse matters. But in many African universities, the president is only interested to be the vice chancellor, possibly of all universities and conferring degrees. Beyond that, they see no value of the university. And this is the kind of right. thinking that we should change going forward so that those who know are the ones who are in the forefront to deal with issues. So what we need, we say, we, we seem to have checks and balances, delegation of authority of power, decision making, so that you don't have the wrong people coming into these important institutions, making decisions on emotion that, that are not informed by the realities and effects on the ground. A merit-based system, a merit-based system that has objective criteria of identifying our best men and women to play critical roles. That is what you need, not patronage. The problem in Africa is that there is too much, much patronage. You are my boy, you are my girl. Therefore, I put you in a place where you have nothing to contribute. And the net effect is that all of us suffer as a result of it. We advertise for a job and before yeah. the so process a, of interview is done, I'm... the position is filled. Yeah. In a, a different question, in, in a country like South Africa, which is very racially div, uh, I, um, diverse, we have, uh, you know, political parties who think that white people should not be there, they don't belong. But Africa is a very diverse country in terms of, uh, continent rather, in terms of racial makeup. I mean, we are at the core, I believe we're all ra one race, but, you know, people still argue that you're black, therefore you're more African than a white person or or somebody from the from North Africa, etc. Do you think Africa belongs only to black people? Not at all. I, I mean, that debate is an old debate. In the 1960s, it used to be said, who is an African? Right. And, and we thought that skin color was the only qualification. But we, uh, but we now know better. 
Of course, dominantly, that is the, the, the critical budge that this is a continent for melanin, melanated people. But the truth be told, I, I know some Africans or people who have African origin who are Anglophiles and Francophiles. Right. They, they have nothing to do with Africa. Yet I know a number of whites who, in whom Africa is born and they care for the continent of Africa. So skin color yeah. in and of itself is not sufficient. It is. It only makes you fast uh, pass the first uh, run. But after that, we want to see it by your conduct that mm. you are an African and that you love Africa and that you believe in Africa. So skin color is the easiest way of yeah. saying I am. But it is the most uh, uh, the the most primary and and basic way of arriving at such a complex situation. So it is yeah. not just that straightforward. Well, I had somebody, a young man in South Africa, who got a PhD in the UK recently, talk about other black people not being black enough. Somebody, he thinks South Africa is run by non non blacks, but not black people. <laughs> <laughs> it's a problem to me. <laughs> so, so we have this: you, I'm blacker than you. Somebody else is not. What does it mean to be black? Uh, really, I mean, first of all, black is is a term of art. We are not actually black, but <coughs> even whites are not proper, are not actually white. But we know that these yeah, are minorities that have grown over the years. The only thing in 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 societies such as Af Africa, where race was weaponized by yeah. a few individuals and made right. as an instrument of segregation, you ought to address those historical injustices. On that, I have no doubt that you've got to create an environment where the majority who are segregated also participate in the economy in a meaningful way, not through tokenism. Sure. Because if you don't address mm -hmm. the problem, people will go back to their primordial instincts and say it is white or black, there is no gray area, and, and, and everybody will suffer for it. So I think in a societies mm -hmm. which have that kind of historical burden, South Africa is leading in that regard, Namibia is leading in that regard, uh, Zimbabwe also had the same problem. Deliberate efforts must be made to address those historical injustices so that people feel, and not just feel, but people are actually involved in the running of the economy in a proper manner. What we yeah. see in South Africa thus far is tokenism. And we are not addressing some of the fundamental issues such as the land question. But how do you address the land question in a manner that is not going to disrupt commerce and agriculture? And, and the idea- We don't want Zimbabwe. We, we don't want another Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. Not the Zimbabwean <laughs> model. You, they are, they are, you'll be amazed, there are ideas, there are people with ideas how this can be done in a programmatic and in an orderly manner. The question is, it must be time bound. If right. you leave it to go on for, to fester for too long, then the impatient people will disrupt it in a manner that will actually affect everybody in a negative fashion. Yeah. True. Prof, uh, we're going to finish soon, but I, I have to ask you, you know, I have friends in Zim, uh, Zimb from Zimbabwe in South Africa who are beginning to say, you know, Soli, we, we think things are actually better in Zimbabwe than here. <laughs> 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 How is South Africa viewed in your view from the rest of the continent? So what it has become over the years? Is it, is it disappointment? Is it like, okay, this is it. Is, this is Africa. You know, South Africa is, in my view, a big brother. I mean, it's a big economy, without doubt. We talk, we complain in Africa about uh, dilapidated infrastructure and uh, many things, and for good reason. But there is a sense in which South Africa, after 1994, was, is seen by quite a number of countries as a country that should be more accommodating. We don't think South Africa is sufficiently accommodated. And when words such as xenophobia are being used, hate black on black, it is for good reason. And, and people normally say, but when you are in trouble, you, you, we gave you sucker. We, we South Africans were, were given sucker in, in, in Zambia, in Malawi, in Kenya, in right. Tanzania. And, and we too expect you to be a little bit more sympathetic to us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and uh, we don't see that sympathy 
uh, to the extent that we should. I know the Africans, uh, South Africans also have a contrary opinion that some of you come here and engage in criminality, taking opportunities that belong to us. But I believe that the cake is big enough to be shared. That is not to say that countries in the neighborhood should not take care of their own backyard. They should. But South Africa should think big. Mm. South Africa should see but, Africa but surely, as a market. But surely people must who come to South Africa, irrespective of whether they come from Africa or other parts of the world, must come through the right channels. There are too many illegal that, people there. With that, I agree with you. To the extent that we still have these sovereign boundaries, I don't expect South Africa must account for everybody who is in South Africa. Correct. I expect you if you are Zimbabwean or Kenyan or whatever from Eswatini, if the laws of South Africa say that you've got to be registered through immigration, you've got to go through that process. And if you don't follow that process, be prepared to be met by the law. That I can't agree. As we move towards a much more unified Africa where there will be free movement of people, that will be a different scenario. But the scenario now that even if South African government is planning for you, they want to know who they are planning for. If you exactly. come in through routes that are not recognized, you are a burden, an unknown burden to a system which does not have the means of knowing where you are. So yeah. I can't agree more that everybody who goes into any country must be documented. My last question to you is this, Prof. How in the world do you remain so young? <laughs> <laughs> my hair is now is gray, <laughs> rather fast. But by God's grace, I engage in exercise quite a bit, and I believe that does help. <laughs> but I know that you celebrated your birthday, your 60th this day. Yes. We'll, we'll, so we are not happy birthday again. Happy belated birthday. <laughs> Thank you very much, and have a good afternoon. We need more of you, not less of you. We yes, need indeed. you to reach I, out I, to them. We I need the noise to be sorry. escalated higher Thank and you. lower. Thank you. Best of luck. To our viewers out there, if you've come this way in this conversation, it means you've enjoyed the content. Thank you very much. Please keep sharing on your social media platforms. And if you want to assist Worldview, you can write to us at world.help at gmail.com. This is Solim Wing from Worldview with Professor Lumumba. Bye-bye, Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, cheers. Bye. Thank you.